If you've got PTSD, ADHD, OCD, eating disorders, early dementia, whatever the issue is, I will try to help you. My definition of a brain healthy diet is it has to nourish the brain, protect the brain, energize the brain. You can see dramatic improvements, even remission of serious chronic mental illnesses with ketogenic diets, no matter how long a person's been ill, no matter what medications they're taking or how many medications or what the dosages are, no matter what the diagnosis is. Ketogenic diets are really unique in this ability to energize the brain and body differently than other types of diets do. 64% of them left the hospital on less psychiatric medication. 44% of them achieved clinical remission from serious mental illness. These dietary interventions are powerful brain medicine. In your new book, you state that we're in the middle of a mental health crisis. Talk about what you feel is at the root of this. I'm convinced that uh, the, our mental health crisis is driven in large part by the deterioration in the quality of our diet. I mean, essentially, for the past at least 75 years, we've been gradually replacing healthy whole foods with industrially refined uh, ingredients. Most importantly, refined carbohydrates and refined seed oils are the so-called vegetable oils. These are the true signature ingredients of modern unhealthy diets. Uh, it's not that we've been eating more meat or saturated fat. The, those, are, those are not new ingredients. We've been eating those since time immemorial. The new ingredients are the, the large amounts of refined carbohydrates, sugar, flour, uh, fruit juice, cereal products, polished grains, and uh, vegetable oils such as soybean oil, sunflower oil, canola oil, et cetera. All right, well, let's follow this story even further. We'll take each one and get into it separately here. So we have the refined carbs. They get into our body. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the physiology yeah. and how that interrupts our brain from working properly. Yeah. So, you know, we evolved to uh, eat whole foods and including carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates from uh, fruits and vegetables and so forth. These uh, foods come with fiber, they come with water, and, and they have a cellular structure. So the body is, is designed to extract carbohydrates from whole foods, and that's not necessarily a dangerous thing. The problem is when you industrially extract those carbohydrates, what you're doing is you're stripping away the fiber, the nutrients, the water, and you're concentrating uh, the, the most, uh, you're concentrating the, 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 the sugar molecules. So for example, um, when you turn sugar cane into sugar, or when you turn beets into sugar, uh, uh, all you're doing then is you're, you're taking in the sugar and really these are naked molecule, naked, uh, carbohydrates. And the problem with that is that they, uh, absorb almost instantaneously into your bloodstream and overwhelm your bloodstream with a, an unnaturally, a uh, steep spike in blood glucose levels. They turn instantly into glucose in the body. And then that steep spike in glucose is followed by an equally steep spike in insulin to be able to manage that uh, sort of tsunami of incoming glucose molecules. And so, and the, and, and the insulin will bring the glucose back down um, as long as you don't have type 2 diabetes yet, the insulin will uh, bring the glucose back down to normal and squirrel away those glucose molecules you know, where they need to go. If, if there are hungry cells that need them for energy, uh, those cells will uh, those cells will allow the glucose to come in, and they'll burn them for energy, or they'll use the glucose to build new parts. Um, and uh, or, and and any excess, if you're eating any carbohydrate beyond what you need in that moment, uh, then uh, all of that excess uh, glucose will be stored as fat. That's a perfectly normal and natural mechanism. But when you overwhelm it with too many glucose molecules at once you'll get this steep spike in insulin and you'll get this exaggerated curve, very steep spike in glucose and insulin. And then you'll get, a uh, uh, you in the beginning, you'll get a really steep crash. And so you might think, well, okay, as long as insulin brings glucose back down to normal, why should we care? The problem is that insulin isn't just a simple blood sugar regulator. Insulin is a master growth hormone. It's a master metabolic hormone. And every cell in your body and brain has insulin receptors and is listening and paying attention to uh, insulin going up and down. And as a master growth hormone, insulin is regulating, talking to lots of other hormones in the body. 
your stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, your appetite regulation hormones like leptin, your uh, your reproductive hormones like estrogen, and, and even your blood pressure regulating hormones like aldosterone. When you're on this blood sugar and insulin roller coaster, you're putting many of your other hormones on an, in, on a roller coaster as well. So it's it it's very the, eating in this way destabilizes you from within. Let's hone in on the brain specifically now. Whatever happens to blood sugar impacts glucose in the brain as well. Let's talk about the story specifically in that area of the brain. Yes. So. When you have uh, spikes and crashes in your blood sugar, you don't just have a blood sugar problem, you also have a brain sugar problem. And the reason for that is that whenever your blood sugar spikes, your your brain sugar will spike as well. The, the level of glucose inside your brain is always proportional to the amount in your blood. It's not the same, but it, it, it mirrors it this way. So the higher your blood sugar, the higher your brain sugar. And uh, so you really never need to worry about low brain glucose. And I know lots of people worry about that. You know, how will I get enough glucose to my brain if I'm not eating enough carbohydrate? You don't need to worry about low brain glucose. What you need to worry about, especially if you are one of the majority of us now who have insulin resistance, you need to worry about low brain insulin. Because every time, if your insulin levels are running too high too often in your bloodstream, you're going to be gradually creating insulin resistance um, at the level of the brain. The blood-brain barrier begins to become insulin resistant. So glucose can still waltz in, no questions asked. It can even waltz into most brain cells unquestioned with the, without the help of insulin. But insulin itself will have a harder and harder time crossing into the brain. And that's a huge problem because brain cells can't use glucose properly or to full capacity to make energy or anything else without adequate insulin. All right, let me try and summarize where we're at with this story. So if we continue to have refined carbs, we're going to spike our blood glucose. What happens in the body is going to happen in the brain. We're going to have too much glucose in the brain. Insulin over time trying to regulate that glucose is going to build up in the body. The blood-brain barrier becomes insulin resistant, doesn't allow it to come into the brain and facilitate the metabolism in the brain like, like we'd want it to be. So talk about that situation in the brain where you don't have enough insulin, even though there's too much in the body, you got a lot of glucose in the brain. Take me through the physiology of what happens next. Yeah, so there are two problems with the high glucose, low insulin brain. So if you if you have insulin resistance, which now more than half of us do, depending on which study you look at and how you define insulin resistance, up to around 90% of us have at least some degree of insulin resistance, but at least 52, 53% of us do, adults in the United States. If you have insulin resistance, you'll have plenty of glucose in the brain, but you won't have enough insulin to use it to full capacity. So you, your brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose and still slowly be starving to death. And that, that paves the road to all kinds of mental health problems. Most importantly, uh, the science is very strong in this area, Alzheimer's disease, which is just a disease. It's, it's a neurodegenerative disease, which simply means brain cells are dying. And so they're dying in large part because their access to energy is being restricted, very slowly restricted over many, many years. So so you have that situation. Um, so the low insulin situation means that you're not going to be able to burn glucose to full capacity. But the high glucose situation is another problem. Uh, when you have high blood sugar and low brain high brain sugar and low brain insulin, it's really kind of a deadly one-two punch for the brain because not only don't you have enough insulin to use that glucose, but you've got so much glucose in the brain that that excess glucose sticks. It literally sticks to all kinds of vital cell components. Uh, it can stick to uh, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, things like DNA and RNA, and can do tremendous damage uh, in the process because when it sticks to these critical components of our brain cells, um, it, it turns them into these kind of disfigured, uh, sticky, caramelized clusters that are crippled and they don't function properly. And if these were left to accumulate in the brain, sort of left to their own devices, they would cause tremendous uh, problems with brain cell signaling, for example, brain and brain function. Fortunately, 
the brain has an immune system. So it doesn't take this lying down. You know, it sees these caramelized clusters accumulating uh, throughout the brain and it sounds alarms. And the immune cells of the brain release uh, inflammatory cytokines and oxygen free radicals. Uh, inflammatory cytokines to deliberately create inflammation and uh, oxygen free radicals to deliberately create what's called oxidative stress. These are like little SOS signals that uh, alert the body that there's a problem that needs attention. And so this is, this is a very normal and healthy part of your brain's immune response to any kind of a threat, including these uh, caramelized clusters, which are called advanced glycation end products or AGEs. And those are aptly named because uh, we know that AGEs are uh, a large part of what's driving premature aging of tissues throughout the body, including brain. So these AGEs trigger this immune reaction. And, uh, you know, if you were just eating this waiver once in a while, it might not be such a bad thing because the immune system will clear these, these, these clusters uh, from your brain. And, and then, but then a period of healing is supposed to take place. But, but for people, most people now, you know, they're eating refined carbohydrates in some form, three, four, five, six times a day with every meal and snack. So this process of, of AGE production, inflammation, and oxidative stress, instead of being temporary and controlled and targeted and healthy, it's chronic and uncontrolled and damaging. You never get a chance. That, that process never gets a chance to quiet down. So you're always, your brain is kind of always in emergency cleanup mode. And the problem with that is that, um, that, that, that doesn't feel good. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, inflammation, you can't feel inflammation in the brain, but it affects your neurotransmitter balance, um, the health of the membranes inside your brain and, and, and really, uh, the, and over time, the ability of your brain to, to heal, repair itself and generate energy. So. This inflammation and oxidative stress, uh, we know that if you're eating too many of the wrong carbohydrates too often, that this can happen in the brain as well as throughout the rest of the body. If you're enjoying this episode, let me know by clicking like and subscribe below. Thank you so much. And now back to the show. All right. So again, to recap our story, we take in too many refined carbs. We're going to spike glucose in the body and brain. And it sounds like there's two different areas that you've kind of branched into that arise issues from that, one being the physical damage in the brain. And then also, we talked about how over time, when we become insulin resistant, the energy in the brain doesn't work like it used to. So it's you're getting this damage, plus you're also getting a lack of energy to the brain. Exactly. So uh, scientists call this sluggish brain glucose processing. They call it cerebral glucose hypometabolism, sluggish brain glucose processing. And, you know, by the time, I mean, this is happening very, very slowly over, over many decades. Alzheimer's disease doesn't happen overnight, just like type 2 diabetes doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's the result of this, these climbing insulin levels and these climbing glucose levels over time that are gradually chipping away at all aspects of our health. And so when you, uh, by the time you notice any memory problems, you can have lost about 25% of your brain's glucose processing power. And, and if you're in that situation, that's not an easy situation to reverse. You may also have lost a certain amount of brain tissue. By the time you notice any memory problems, your hippocampus, the brain's learning and memory center, can have already shrunk by 10% due to cell death. So these are dire circumstances. Um, but the good news is it just as you know, you really don't want to start working on this problem too early in terms of prevention, but it's also almost never too late to begin working on this problem because you can bridge that energy gap, uh, even if you have severe insulin resistance with uh, a ketogenic diet. All right, we're going to get to that. But first I want to talk about, it sounds like there's an overlap here between Degeneration, you mentioned Alzheimer's, so dementia yeah. and mental health challenges. So we started off talking about this from a mental health perspective, but Alzheimer's has come in a couple times. As a psychiatrist, how do you look at the difference between those two? 
Yeah, you know, there are some scientists and researchers who believe that certain forms of mental illness are actually, uh, are that they put you at higher risk for dementia later in life. And this is absolutely true, but they're, they're, I mean, it's, it's absolutely true that, that the, that conditions such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder put you at higher risk, major depression, put you at higher risk for uh, a dementia later in life. But there are scientists and researchers who see um, the, this process as a continuum, meaning that uh, you know all kinds of mental health problems are rooted in energy uh, regulation issues. Um, many of the mental health problems that we uh, psychiatrists treat, the ones that aren't Alzheimer's, let's say depression, psychosis, um, even some forms of ADHD and OCD um, and, and, and anxiety disorders, many of these conditions we now know uh, you can see either insulin resistance at a, at a higher rate in these conditions or sluggish brain glucose processing. So problems with glucose processing are not just about dementia. They really have uh, they really have a fundamental role to play in many mental health disorders. And it's really not surprising since you know energy is really everything to the brain. It's a very high, it, the brain I'd like to say is an energy hog, right? It demands a constant supply of high quality energy, 10 times the amount you would expect for an organ of its size because it's an electrical organ. And it needs, a, it needs that supply of energy to be smooth, steady, reliable, and, and clean burning in order to be, to be as safe as possible over time. So um, of course, if the brain isn't able to access energy reliably, any number of things can and will go wrong. And I think the, the kinds of things that go wrong probably have more to do with uh, your genes and your family history and how you've lived your life to that point. Uh, but uh, you know, th but there's no question that if your brain metabolism is not in good working order, then your mental health won't be either. When you talked about genetics, there it got me thinking about: Would it be fair to say that down the line we might realize? Just like a person, because of this core issue that we're talking about today, can have different manifestations of a mental health challenge, that dementia plus these mental health challenges can almost be put in a bucket. And depending on genetics and environment, like you talked about, different things are going to break in different ways for different people. Yes. And the same is true in the body as well. So when you have high insulin levels and insulin resistance, uh, and you begin to lose control of your, you may begin to lose control of your glucose, you may develop type 2 diabetes. But not everybody with severe insulin resistance develops type 2 diabetes. Some people never never will. Um, but those people may may develop heart disease, or they may develop dementia, or they may develop fatty liver disease, or they may become obese. There are many, or they may develop certain forms of cancer are very strongly tied to insulin resistance, uh, breast cancer, for example, colon cancer. So um, there, I think all of us will eventually pay a price for a high insulin lifestyle. Uh, it's just a, uh, sort of a game of Russian roulette, you know, which, which form of these, which diseases you will eventually be struggling with. And that all sounds really dire, but, uh, we have tremendous control over our insulin levels. If we, if we understand what's driving them to these unnatural heights in the first place. All right. Before we get to the diet piece. Well, this ties into the diet, but I want to come back to how we opened up. You mentioned two different categories of foods, one being the refined carbs, the other being seed oils. Mm. So let's come back to the seed oil piece and tie that into what we've discussed. Yeah. So the, the science, uh, the, the research into seed oils is really in its infancy, especially when it comes to brain health. Um, there's some emerging science uh, to, that should give us pause about how these seed oils affect uh, our, our physical health. But what, I'm, what I really wanted to understand as best I could uh, for the book was how seed oils might be affecting the brain. And so the problem with seed oils is that they are, they are unnaturally concentrated sources of a very fragile polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acid, a PUFA, omega-6 PUFA, called linoleic acid. And linoleic acid is, um, it's naturally found in small amounts in, um, in, in many plant and animal foods. It's widespread in, in whole foods, plant and animal foods, but at very small concentrations. So it's, you know, we are designed to see 
certain tiny amounts of it. Um, but uh, but so these vegetable oils, uh, such as uh, say for example soybean oil, very very high in linoleic acid. This very fragile omega six fatty acid. I mean, it, it it it's almost as if you look at it the wrong way and it falls apart. You know, it it, it oxidizes so called. It, 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 it falls apart under oxidative stress. It oxidizes very easily if there's oxidative stress around, and and it also will then self oxidize, and you'll you'll get this sort of chain reaction where lots of toxic byproducts are formed by these um, uh, oxidative reactions, these chain reactions. So uh, now this, this you know, the, it's one thing to think about this in the body, what this might be doing to the body, but in the brain in particular, the brain does absorb. So the first question is, can it cross the blood-brain barrier? And yes, it can. So the, the omega-6 and the omega-3 fatty acids cross the brain. Um, and to, to some small extent and uh, a little bit each day. And, but, but then what happens to it? So the emerging science is telling us that linoleic acid is absorbed across the blood-brain barrier, but then the vast majority of it is burned for energy. And this is very concerning because the brain uh, really is not designed to burn fatty acids for energy. I mean, the omega-6 fatty acids are very long molecules, um, and they're called long chain PUFAs. What the brain is designed to burn uh, for ideal function and energy production is small molecules, glucose and ketones primarily, and other small molecules, not very long uh, fatty acids. So, And the, the reason for that is because the brain doesn't have a lot of capacity to deal with excessive inflammation and oxidative stress. And when you burn fatty acids for energy, um, that process creates a lot more oxidative stress than, uh, than is generated when you're burning smaller molecules. So uh, there is the, the, the hypothesis is then that linoleic acid, excessive linoleic acid consumption um, could contribute, could be one of the driving forces behind excessive oxidative stress in the brain which in turn is then uh, one of the very common underlying features of most of the mental health conditions that we fear. And with the oxidative stress, that ties nicely with what we talked about before, because part of that picture with refined carbs was the oxidative stress. So we're seeing the full circle here and the connection. Exactly. And so, you know, um, it might be helpful to talk a little about what oxidative stress is, um, because we're told all the time that we should uh, consume foods that are rich in antioxidants, uh, colorful plant foods that contain, that have natural antioxidant superpowers. And we're never really told, well, what's causing all this excessive oxidative stress in the first place? Um, and I think I'd really let, that's where I think uh, people should really focus their energy is really on first do no harm, keep the foods out of the diet, remove the foods from the diet that are causing all of that excess oxidative stress in the first place. But these foods that are that are claimed to have um, antioxidant properties, um, they really function very poorly in the human body. They work well in plants, but they don't work very well in the human body. We don't absorb them very well. Uh, as soon as we absorb them, if we do absorb a small percentage of them, we eliminate them as rapidly as possible. So, and the reason why we don't need them, why doesn't the body welcome them in? Because we have our own antioxidants. We have our own, all of our cells are equipped with their own antioxidant systems and molecules that are designed to mop up the natural amount of oxidative stress that we're expected to see in our daily lives. And that oxidative stress comes from the sun's rays. It comes from uh, and, and it comes from the the foods we eat because every time you try, every time you eat, even if it's a healthy whole food. The process of, it, of breaking those molecules down and burning them for energy does create a certain amount uh, of oxidative stress. So Mother Nature expects you to see a certain amount of it. It doesn't expect you to flood your system with lots and lots of um, free radicals. And that's what happens when you eat um, uh, refined carbohydrates and refined seed oils. And I know part of the challenge with the linoleic acid is that it becomes incorporated into the fat in the body and stays there for years. That, so in your opinion, how much of the challenge with them is from fats we've consumed in years past versus the acute exposure if we're going out to say a restaurant and eating? 
Yeah. So you're making an excellent point because we don't store fat in the brain. So the linoleic acid, if the, you know, the brain needs to do something with it. And I think that's why perhaps it may burn it for energy is because it, it can't store it. In your body, in the rest of your body, um, we have, of course, an, an virtually unlimited capacity to store fat, but we are designed to store primarily saturated fat. Um, and, and, and we do that on purpose. So for example, even if you eat no fat at all, um, the carbohydrates that you eat, if you, if you eat more carbohydrates than your, and, and, and then your cells can burn for energy in that moment, then they need, then they need to use for their construction products and to make energy. If you take in more carbohydrate than you need in that moment, you are going to have to store some of that excess as glycogen in the liver and glycogen in the muscles. This is starch. But we have very limited capacity to do this. Uh, we can only store about a day's worth of, of, of carbohydrate as uh, of carbohydrate energy as starch. What do you do with the rest of it? You're going to turn it into fat. The liver turns it on purpose into saturated fat, not unsaturated fat, not canola oil, not olive oil, turns it into saturated fat. And, and why? Because saturated fat is compact, it's lightweight, it, and, it, and it burns easily. You can chop it up easily into, into smaller molecules and, and burn it. So um, now we're not supposed to be storing lots and lots of linoleic acid in our fat. Uh, we were only designed to see maybe 2 to 4% of our fat is supposed to be linoleic acid. If you look back at some studies of hunter-gatherer populations from a long time ago, um, their body fat was, was, was something on the order of, you know, four to 6% linoleic acid. Um, now, when you look at the body fat of Americans, you see that our, our body fat is roughly 30% linoleic acid and climbing. And so it's anybody's guess as to what the health implications of that are. But that, but these are very fragile fats. They don't store well. They don't, they, they fall apart easily and they cause a lot of oxidative stress and these toxic byproducts that um, when there's oxidative stress in the area, which all cells are under some amount of oxidative stress, these fats do fall apart and then they, they can lead to these chain reactions of you know, generating other toxic molecules that are reactive and dangerous potentially uh, for our health. While we're on the topic of omega-6s, let's talk about the other PUFA, omega-3s which is also relatively unstable, I believe actually more unstable than the omega-6s. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about those when it comes to brain health and beyond? So the omega-3s are really interesting because it's easy for people to get confused. There are different types of omega-3s. So the, the types of omega-3s, uh, these, are, these are also, as you said, these are fragile, long-chain, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and so these are also fragile. Um, uh, but these are essential to our health as opposed to linoleic acid, which I argue in the book is not essential. Um, but, uh, but we do need, uh, omega, these omega-3 fatty acids and the ones the body and brain use are EPA and DHA, um, DHA throughout the body and throughout the brain and EPA primarily in the body as an anti-inflammatory, um, um, part of our immune system to fight inflammation. But in the brain, DHA serves irreplaceable functions in the brain, including during brain development, brain cell signaling, um, uh, eye health you know, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and making energy. So DHA is a really um, very special molecule that, that no other molecule can take its place because it's a very special configuration. The shape of DHA um, gives it what are called quantum mechanical properties, which just means that it, it acts as a semiconductor of electricity. So wherever electrons are busy, such as the electron transport chain inside your mitochondria, where energy is being made, um, in the retina of the eye, where sunlight is being, uh, uh, um, the energy from sunlight is being transformed into electrical signals, all of the, and, and when the brain is developing, um, and the, uh, the DHA is important for guiding those uh, nerve cells towards their, towards their final destinations as the brain is developing, DHA um, uh, is, is busy in all of those places. And so um, now there's a third omega-3 uh, called ALA. And ALA is, the, uh, is found in both plant and animal foods. DHA and EPA, the ones our bodies are actually looking for, our bodies don't use ALA, um, 
the ones our bodies are looking for are only found in animal foods and algae. Algae is neither a plant nor an animal, um, but you can't eat the algae and get, get the DHA and EPA out of it. You need to take a supplement that's been extracted, industrially extracted from the algae. And so for people who follow a vegan diet, it's very important to use an algae supplement. Um, but, uh, but so the ALA that's in plant foods uh, and animal foods, um, that uh, we, we can theoretically convert some small percentage of it into EPA and perhaps a little bit into, into DHA, but it's extremely difficult and in some cases impossible. Um, the conversion rates between ALA and DHA and EPA are somewhere between zero and 9%. 9%, the, the, the champions of, of making this conversion are, are pregnant women who, who desperately need high quantities of DHA for the developing baby's brain. So they are the best at, at making this conversion. The rest of us are not very good at this. Um, and so we really can't rely on um, plant sources of omega-3s to meet our needs, particularly uh, uh, during pregnancy and the first thousand days of life. Okay. No, that was a great explanation. And given the importance of DHA and EPA, somebody that wants to maintain optimal brain health, should they consider taking in a food that's high in those on a regular basis, such as a fatty fish, such as salmon, or taking a fish oil supplement? How do you feel about those? Well, in general, I, I, I'm definitely a whole foods first. Um, you know, I follow whole foods first philosophy. That's what I recommend. Our bodies are best able to absorb and regulate the intake of nutrients when they come from whole foods. Uh, partly because those nutrients will are, exist in a context of other nutrients and macronutrients that that uh, allow us to make better use of, of those nutrients. So, uh, whole foods first is my 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 mantra. But uh, but if you if you don't eat animal foods or you don't you don't like these foods, um, you can you can take a supplement. Um, it's just really important to research the quality of that supplement because, as you were saying. These uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids are very fragile, so they go rancid quite easily, and then they they've lost their power to be helpful to you. So so make sure that you're taking a good quality omega three supplement uh, from fish oil or krill, not from uh, you know flax seed or walnuts, chia, and so forth. It needs to come or, or or algae, right? So it needs to come from algae or krill or fish oil. Um, the other piece of that story, which I think is often um, overlooked, is that our requirement for omega-3 uh, probably depends to a great deal on how much omega-6 we're taking in. Because, uh, you know, the, these two types of fatty acids, the omega-3s and omega-6s, they share certain pathways. And so if you overwhelm that path, those pathways with too much omega-6 from, say, vegetable oil, you're probably going to need a lot more omega-3 fatty acids um, uh, to, 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 to rebalance that equation. So we, it's unclear exactly how much omega-3 we need because most of us are eating so much omega-6 um, that it may make it look as if we need a lot more omega-3 than we actually do. So in addition to making sure you're taking in good sources of omega-3s, the DHA and EPA, it's also very important to minimize as much as you can uh, your intake of the uh, omega-6 fatty acids, the, the uh, uh, linoleic acid in particular. So for somebody who's on a clean diet, say they're on the continuum of omnivore, more animal-based or carnivore, the piece I still want to tease out, would they want to consider including fish on a regular basis or would they get enough, you know, DHA and EPA through like beef and other animal foods that they're eating? That is the question. And I think that... I as far as I know, there's no definitive answer to this question because our our need for these nutrients, and I will quote uh, my friend and colleague Amber O'Hearn uh, about this, our need for nutrients is context dependent. So it, the, how many of which types of nutrients you need depends on the on your dietary pattern. So for example, if you're eating a diet that's very high in refined carbohydrates, you're going to need an awful lot more, say, magnesium and, and B vitamins, 
to extract the energy to process those carbohydrates. And so your need for those nutrients will be higher than if you're eating a diet where your metabolism is based more on fat than carbohydrate. So, and because all of these studies of our requirements for various nutrients are done in the context of a very high carbohydrate, high vegetable oil diet, it's really anybody's guess, you know, how much we actually need. But, um, you know, I've asked, I've asked, you know, experts about this, um, at, including the great Dr. Michael Crawford, um, who's been, who's really considered, you know, the, the father of fish oil uh, biology. Um, I learned most of what I understand about DHA f from, from listening to his lectures and reading his papers. Um, I asked him at a conference once, you know, um, do we have to eat seafood or what if we ate animals, uh, you know, land animals um, that were that were eating a wild type diet, you know, the, the diet that's appropriate for their species. And he said, you know, it's interesting, um, the omega-3 uh, um, content of animal fat used to be higher than it is now. And this is because we're not the only ones who aren't eating properly. <laughs> Most of the animals we're eating are also not eating properly anymore. And so um, there's this, you know, it's a, it, it, uh, it behooves us all not just to eat better for ourselves, but also to make sure that, um, that the animals that we rely on for, for our nutritional livelihood are humanely treated, fed a species appropriate diet, given ample access to the outdoors, that they lead as close to a, you know, a, a natural life as they can for their own sake, as well as for ours. Okay. Well, let's move into the diet as a whole. Because there's a lot of nuance in what we just got into that I want to dig further into, but I think it's important we set the template here before we get into that nuance. And you mentioned ketogenic diet before. So we already know seed oils are out and we want to watch our refined carbs and eliminate those. Let's talk about this ketogenic diet and how we structure that. Yeah. So there are many ways to do a ketogenic diet. Not all of them are very healthy. Some of them are much healthier than others, just like any dietary pattern. There are good and bad ways to, to do it, less, less healthy and more healthy ways to do it. So, um, so well, first let's define a ketogenic diet. So a ketogenic diet is any way of eating that lowers insulin levels enough to turn on fat burning and generate clinically meaningful levels of ketones in the blood. And most uh, experts would say that that process uh, 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 begins metabolically meaningful or clinically meaningful levels of ketones in the blood begin at about 0 0.5 millimole of beta hydroxybutyrate uh, using a blood ketone meter to measure that. Um, and then, you know, higher than that may be better for, you know, uh, for depending on, on the circumstances. So, but that's where the process begins. And so, uh, the ketones are very important. Uh, it can be very important, particularly if you have a condition in which you have lost some of your ability to process glucose properly. So if you have insulin resistance, um, then you have lost some of your ability to, to process glucose uh, uh, properly. And uh, if you have certain types of psychiatric conditions, um, these include certain forms of autism, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, um, and, uh, and early dementia, there are many mental health conditions where the ability to process glucose, so to extract glucose uh, energy from glucose is impaired in some way. And so if that's the case, a ketogenic diet that generates ketones uh, that can circulate in your bloodstream and cross into the brain uh, to bridge that energy gap, that ability is a godsend because you need that supplemental energy source. And, and uh, that, that if you, if you're able to bridge that energy gap with ketones, um, early enough in your life, you might be able to prevent, um, you know, uh, prevent some of those cells that have been sputtering and, you know, kind of trying to just get by, um, you might be able to sort of bring them back online and help them to thrive again. And, and, you know, that, that experience of, you know, sort of waking up the brain with ketones is a really common experience that patients have. That you know, when they switch to a ketogenic diet, especially if they've had things like memory problems or brain fog, depression, they suddenly feel like, um, and there are many different phrases that have been used for this: the lights have come back on, or they've woken up from a long winter's nap, or suddenly, um, you know, their brain gets they see clearly again, they have mental clarity. 
right? So, so this experience seems to be related to energy production. So a ketogenic diet uh, is really, um, I mean, there are a couple of other ways you can get into ketosis and make ketones. One is fasting and another is calorie restriction. So even if you're eating a very high carbohydrate diet, if it's very low in calories, say 750 calories per day or less, you will go into ketosis. So there are different ways. And, and if you exercise very vigorously, you will start to enter ketosis as well. You'll start to burn fat and get into ketosis. So there are many different ways to get into ketosis, but the only way to stay in ketosis all the time without fasting long-term, which ultimately becomes dangerous, um, or restricting calories long-term, which also ultimately becomes dangerous, um, or exercising around the clock, which isn't possible, is with a ketogenic diet. And the way to get into ketosis with a diet um, uh, is, is by lowering your carbohydrate uh, down to usually less than 50 grams per day, often 20 grams per day or so, um, and replacing those carbohydrate calories, which are normally the majority of the calories in our diet, replacing those calories with fat and keeping protein adequate. It, it doesn't need to be a very high uh, excess protein diet. In fact, it's better if it isn't. Protein to meet your needs, fat to meet your energy requirements, and carbohydrates as low um, as you need to go to turn to, to get your insulin levels down and turn on fat burning. So ketogenic diets are really unique in this ability to energize the brain and body differently than other types of diets do. What I love about this keto template is the fact that it's addressing everything we've talked about to this point. You're going to bring insulin down. You're going to bring down oxidative stress. If you're eating the right oils, wait, inflammation too will come down. If you're eating the right oils, you're going to have those eliminated as part of what we've talked about. And then the other piece, so it's it's stopping destruction, and then it's providing this additional energy source. So it's a win-win all around. It really is. You know, one of the benefits of intermittent fasting is you enter this uh, low insulin state. Um, and that allows, that allows different pathways to switch on than when you're processing food. So when you're processing food, um, there, are lots of your burning and building pathways are, are, are very, very active. You're taking those molecules in and you're using them. Uh, so it's almost as, as though you've got your foot on the gas pedal. And, and if you imagine your cell being a factory and all of these, you know, uh, assembly lines and, and furnaces are, 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 are being, uh, stimulated by the incoming uh, fuel, right? When you, when you stop eating, that can quiet down to a certain extent. And you can, you can do some maintenance work in your factory. You can kind of clean things up. You can do some recycling. You can take out some trash, you know, and, and you, can, you can repair some of, the, some of the damage that's happened to your machinery uh, during, that high, during, uh, during that high glucose period of time. So when your food, if you're, if you're eating in a way, and this is how unfortunately many people do now, if you're eating almost all the time, <laughs> every two or three hours, your body never gets a chance. Your insulin levels never get a chance to come down low enough to let that switch take place. That it's called the glucose to ketone switch, where you're burning less glucose and more ketones. And when that switch gets flipped, all of these healing and repairing and uh, resting and recovering pathways uh, and, and recycling pathways are allowed to, to, to turn on. So you really want to spend, I mean, I believe uh, this is based on my reading of the science that all of us should be spending some time in ketosis on a regular basis. It doesn't mean for, for optimal health, it doesn't mean that everybody has to be in ketosis all the time. For some of us, we do. Some of us do need to be in ketosis all the time because we've lost so much of our ability to process glucose effectively and, and, and uh, you know, in a way that isn't going to be uh, damaging for us. But if you still have a reasonably healthy metabolism, even if you don't have any mental health problems yet, even if you're healthy in every other way you can measure, you still want to protect that metabolic switch for life. And, and, and so I, I believe that it's important to go into ketosis on a regular basis. And I think this is the benefit of not snacking between meals, making sure that you're not eating overnight, that you're taking a nice long break between dinner and breakfast, ideally, maybe even waiting till lunch, um, really give that, give your system, give your 
delicate insulin signaling system and all of those uh, building and burning pathways that are usually in high gear right after you've eaten, give them a rest. And that allows your natural healing um, uh, processes to, to, to help you uh, recover from whatever damage uh, might have been going on during that uh, food processing period of time. <laughs> For somebody that's tuning in right now and they're metabolically unhealthy, say they're suffering from a mental health challenge too, but they're excited about the hope we're providing here and the information, how do you recommend they transition into this keto template? Because if they're metabolically broken and they're a sugar burner right now, insulin resistant, how do they do this in a way that is going to be, you know, we want them to stay on this long term. We want them to have a good experience and do it over a period of time that facilitates a good transition. And then the other layer I'll add to that is testing for ketones early on, something you recommend during that transition at least. Yeah. So um, I recommend in the book a gradual transition for a lot of reasons. We'll come back to that. But um, what you're really doing with a ketogenic diet is you're lowering your insulin levels, right? So a ketogenic diet is any way of eating that lowers insulin levels enough to turn fat burning on and generate ketones, right? So you, you have to design the diet in a way that's going to lower your insulin levels. And I show you how to do that in the book. And we've already kind of talked about it a little bit. As your insulin levels come down, fat burning turns on and ketones start to rise in the blood. So now you're in ketosis, right? So, so this, uh, but, but, but you're not there yet. You're not home free yet <laughs> because just because you've generated ketones and you you can see them on your meter. Uh, I, there are different ways of measuring ketones. Um, there's a blood meter, there's a breath meter, there's, there are urine strips. The, the blood meter is the most accurate way of measuring uh, what your ketone levels are in your blood in real time. The other measures aren't as accurate, but they're still so much better than not measuring at all. Uh, at least in the beginning, it's really helpful to know how you need to eat to keep your ketone levels in, or in, a, in what is considered uh, by many of us to be a, a therapeutic, potentially therapeutic range. Right, so 0.5 millimole for a lot of people isn't going to be high enough, um, and uh, because to to bridge that energy gap. So uh, in a lot of cases, we see that people need to have their blood ketone levels. The, the ketone level that's measured by the blood meter is called beta hydroxybutyrate. The beta hydroxybutyrate level you want to be at least 1.0 millimole. Um, and in some cases you might need it to be higher 1.5 or even two, but somewhere between one and three for most people uh, is going to be a reasonable place to start and experiment with. You can then fine tune it from there based on what you notice in terms of your mental health progress. Uh, as you monitor those ketones, you might notice, oh, I feel my best when I'm at say 1.2 or higher, right? Or you might say, oh, when I go above three, I don't feel very good. I need to make sure I'm not going too high because you can actually, ketones can be too high. So you're going to be learning about your metabolism as you measure and go along. So coming back to, okay, you've got ketones showing up on your meter. That's a wonderful thing. That's only step one because it takes cells a decent length of time to switch gears. Uh, and be able to use ketones and fatty acids. Um, the rest of the body uses a lot of fatty acids as well as some ketones to be able to burn those molecules efficiently for energy. So this transition can take, you know, two, three, four, six weeks and really optimal fat adaptations called fat adaptation, burning fat efficiently for energy, optimally for energy. The, the optimal fat adaptation can take months, but most of that adaptation takes place within the first two to six weeks. So getting through that period is most of what my work in, with patients is about. Because as you're transitioning to a ketogenic diet, your brain and body are, they're, they're, they're seeking their new equilibrium. Things have been disrupted. You're saying, okay, we're going to do things differently now. It's as though you've been Let's say you've been making, let's say you, you're, you own a factory that's been making Volkswagens for 20 years, and now you've got a new foreman coming in and say, oh, we're going to make Mercedes now. That doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> Lots of different parts. You need to order new parts. You need to, you know, you need to change the pathways and the systems uh, inside your factory. You need to train the workers. 
everything needs to shift gears in order for you to be able to make that new, new car. Same is true with burning uh, ketones and fatty acids for energy. If you've lost a lot of your metabolic flexibility, which many of us now have, you won't be able to switch comfortably, quickly, and easily between fat and carbohydrate as your energy source. Children do this beautifully. Adults, not so well. Uh, so, so you want to give yourself that time. And when you're transitioning, that process of seeking your new equilibrium can be uncomfortable. It can be physically uncomfortable. It can be psychologically uncomfortable. And so that's where uh, some professional support really comes in. Uh, and that, that's why... That's why, you know, I train clinicians how to do this train, uh, in, in, uh, to, to help people with mental health um, concerns transition safely to a ketogenic diet uh, because the medications need to be managed very carefully. Mental health needs to be managed carefully. Physical health conditions need to be managed carefully during that, um, that transition period. And then once you get to the other side, um, and this can be for some people as little as three days. For some people, more like three weeks. For others, it may be as long as three or four months, usually not longer than that. Um, you will usually, in most cases, experience um, what I really um, I think, I think this is the right phrase for this, a different state of mind. You've fundamentally changed your brain's operating system. And for most people, it feels very different to be running uh, on more ketones and less glucose than it does to be trying to run on mostly or all glucose uh, almost all the time. It's a very different feeling. Would it be fair to say in a general sense, somebody that's going to take this on themselves, somebody who is, we'll use the example, mentally healthy at this point, not on medications, but wants to be preventative, is the whole idea just to slowly lower the carbs then? Because you mentioned it's such a difference in the transition depending on the person is it just really a feel thing and then if you have a meter that's measuring ketones factoring that in as well or just in a really general sense because again it's hard there's a lot of nuance to all of this but i'm assuming it's just slowly bringing the carbs down and letting your body adjust slower is better and it's safer i mean there's some some people can switch easily in and out of ketosis like i said but that's not the majority of us and uh, when you add medicines and other health issues into the mix, it just becomes much more complicated. So what I've done in the book, just because safety first, right? There's no need to plunge yourself overnight into ketosis. <laughs> you, there's no emergency uh, going on. Um, uh, and if there is, diet is not your answer right now. You need to stabilize that emergency situation first. Um, but uh, so what I've done in the book um, is I've asked people to lower their carbohydrate intake to about 90 grams a day for a couple of weeks first. The for reference purposes, uh, for comparison, the standard sort of typical American diet contains between, say, 225 and 325 grams of carbohydrate per day. Um, so you you're lowering it by, say, about two-thirds or so, depending on what you're eating now. And what that does is that allows your insulin levels to come down more gradually, because if you drop your insulin like a stone by, say, prolonged fasting or very strict ketogenic diet, and you're trying to get really high ketones on your meter uh, in a matter of two or three days, you can do that. You will generate ketones pretty quickly if you do that in most cases, but that's not necessarily <laughs> what you want to do, because when your insulin levels drop too quickly from too great a height especially if you're eating a very high insulin diet, that's going to be a huge, un completely unnecessary shock to your brain and your body. Uh, because high insulin, uh, uh, when your insulin levels are very high, insulin tells your body, for example, to hold on to excess fluid and excess, excess water and salt. And when you drop your insulin levels uh, uh, from a great height, uh, dramatically, your fluid and you're going to lose a lot of water and you're going to lose a lot of sodium through your kidneys very quickly. Now you want to, these are healthy changes. You want to lose that fluid retention. Of course, that's a good thing. You don't want to be holding on to too much sodium. That's also, these are healthy changes, but when you do this too quickly, it's, it can be dangerous. Your blood pressure can drop, especially if you're taking a blood pressure lowering medication, your blood sugar can drop. Um, and especially if you're taking a blood sugar lowering medication. So 
these are really, really, I mean, these can be, if you're not approaching this properly, life-threatening uh, changes to, this is a, ketogenic diets are powerful biochemical metabolic interventions. Now you want that, you want the power of that diet, but you want to be smart about how you approach it. And so this is not a dangerous diet, but in combination with certain health conditions and certain medications, the transition can be dangerous. And that's why you need good professional support. The other issue is the, the psychiatric medications themselves, because as you're transitioning to a ketogenic diet, those medications um, will require some monitoring. The, the levels of certain medications can change the blood levels and also the side effects of those medications. You can, you can start to sometimes feel more sensitive to certain medications. And that's where really a skilled um, psychiatrist who has a lot of skill with uh, managing medications and helping you adjust the doses is just really very important. How do you feel about somebody using exogenous ketones or an MCT oil during that transition phase? Obviously, we still need to adjust our own metabolism and then beyond. Are they something that you see as being helpful tools for people that are already in ketosis on a regular basis? So both both aspects there. Yeah, so exogenous ketones, uh, they're a tool, okay? And uh, they're a tool we didn't have available to us um, mm -hmm. uh, all that long ago, mm -hmm. but we do have them now and people are very interested in them. Lots of people are making lots of money on these supplements. Um, but for good reason, I mean, they can be useful. And so uh, I, I tend, well, let me, let, let, me, let me say this. When you're first transitioning to a ketogenic diet, which is what we were just talking about, you can see these, these, um, this drop in energy. You can see people feeling really tired, uh, unfocused, even depressed. Uh, they haven't, they're not able yet to make full use of the ketones and uh, fatty acids that they're asking their cells to burn. So they can run sometimes low on energy. And what can be helpful sometimes in these situations is support your ketone levels, support that brain and, and body energy with exogenous ketones, ketone supplements. So these can be either uh, MCT oil is one uh, option. MCT oil, these are just shorter fats. So it takes less time to chop them into even smaller ketones. So they turn rapidly into ketones in the body, so they can raise your ketone levels a little bit, um, uh, sometimes enough to, to make a noticeable difference. Um, and then the next level up is ketone salts. Um, these are actual beta-hydroxybutyrate molecules attached to salt molecules, usually sodium and or calcium. And these uh, can raise your ketone levels even a little bit more. And then there are ketone esters and pure beta-hydroxybutyrate supplements. Um, these are the most expensive, but they're also the most uh, effective at raising ketone levels in the blood. And so all of these can be useful as you're transitioning. If, if you're not, if you're having trouble transitioning, they may be worth trying, but there are a couple of problems with them. So one is they're expensive. Um, another is that they only last, you know, an hour or two in the body. So if you're going to be really counting on them, you need to take them multiple times per day. And they certainly, you can't take them overnight, right? While you're sleeping. Um, so, uh, they have their limitations. They're also highly processed, uh, ingredients. Uh, so they're not natural. We're not, we're not naturally exposed to these, these fats and these salts. Uh, so we don't really know, you know, if there's any risk involved there, but you know, you want to, I, again, I'm a food first, uh, psychiatrist. So I really like you I, ideally, especially once you've transitioned onto the diet and hopefully you don't need that kind of extra support anymore. Ideally, what you want um, is not just more ketones in the blood. You want your glucose and insulin levels to be nice and low because your gl high glucose and insulin levels are what's driving a lot of the metabolic um, mayhem in the first place and driving a lot of these uh, processes like the inflammation and the oxidative stress and the insulin resistance that underlies so many of these mental health disorders, right? So if you're just taking a supplement, you won't get the benefit of lowering your insulin and glucose levels down to where they need to be. Um, only on a ketogenic diet can you make your own ketones from inside your own body uh, smoothly, reliably, 24-7, around the clock, for free, <laughs> and lower your glucose and insulin levels on top of that because you can't be in ketosis if your glucose and insulin levels are high, um, uh, unless something is terribly wrong. So, uh, 
um, you really, you want all three of those things. You want low insulin, low glucose, and a reasonable sort of reasonably therapeutic range of, of, of ketones themselves. That that's what that's will bring you optimal metabolic results uh, from your ketogenic diet. But I also use supplements sometimes to help people get back on a ketogenic diet quickly when they've uh, when their diet's been interrupted. Let's say by a holiday or life or whatever happens or a decision to take a day off to get people, uh, 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 have them uh, support their higher ketone levels the very next day while their bodies are trying to burn off that extra carbohydrate that they that they splurged on. So you can use them as tools. Um, and, and in some cases, longer term, people who aren't able to change their diet or, or can't for whatever reason, say cognitive impairment, change their diet, then these become really important tools. But for most of us, um, I try not to use, use them, use them too, too much. <laughs> Coming back to our analogy there of the Volkswagen factory transitioning to a Mercedes, as we're talking about these hacks for ketosis, it gets me thinking about our body and our metabolism. Somebody who is a sugar burner hacking that with these, say the MCT oil or the exogenous ketones. I wonder how differently those work in the body for somebody that hasn't changed their metabolism. Such a good question. One of the questions I love thinking about, and I don't have an answer for you, but I will tell you what it is, is the question I like thinking about is, you know, our metabolism is designed in this yin-yang fashion, right? So when insulin is high, ketones are low. When insulin is low, ketones are high. So it's very, it, it's completely unnatural to have both high insulin and high ketones at the same time. So when you're eating a standard diet, your insulin levels will be high. And then you take a, an exogenous ketone supplement. Now you've got insulin and ketones together. I'm not really sure what, you know, how, whether there are any negatives to that, but there might be. Um, and it's interesting to think about, right? But I, I can tell you that you will not get the full benefits of, of, of ketosis um, simply with supplements alone, because in order to really turn on those, those healing and recycling pathways and all those maintenance pathways, you have to have low insulin levels. And so ketones alone are not going to do that. They'll help, they'll help you with energy production, but they're not going to help you shift gears. They're not going to help you go from that sort of, um, ramped up state of, of, uh, food processing down to the quiet healing, recycling, repairing mode that, that you want to switch into on a regular basis. Have you ever seen with somebody that's new to this and they haven't adapted their metabolism over time using again, one of these hacks to get the feeling of what it'll be like when they do go through that transition and start making their own ketones. So somebody right now who's depressed or has high anxiety using say an MCT oil to hack that in the meantime, and this ties to what we were just talking about, the fact, can our machinery even use them properly if it hasn't adapted? So a lot of layers to this, but I'm wondering if you've seen anybody feel the mental effects of what we're getting at with making the dietary change in the short term by hacking it. Yeah. So I've had patients do this and there are some, you know, there are case reports in the literature of people benefiting from strategies like this. Um, you know, some of the people who have come to me for help, um, have tried this before. And some of them who come to me for help, uh, ask if they can try it when they start working with me. I've seen some people do this. Um, but what I can tell you is it's really hit or miss. So some people will say, oh, you know, I, I do feel better. You know, my mood is a little better. I feel a little steadier. My better mental clarity it doesn't last long, but you know, they, they perceive benefits, um, cognitive benefits primarily, and sometimes mood benefits, but it's really been hit or miss. And, and, and so some people take them and they feel absolutely no different, uh, at all. And I can only imagine that, that, uh, that the reason for that may be that, um, that the, whatever the mechanism is, whatever the underlying problem is that's created their particular mental health disorder, isn't being addressed by ketones alone. So it could be that the insulin levels are still too high. It could be that the glucose levels are still too high. It could be that their mental health issue has absolutely nothing to do, do with ketones or glucose or insulin, because that's certainly a possibility as well. But what I, what I would, I mean, I, people can certainly try that, 
But what I don't want people to think is that, oh, if I try that and it doesn't work for me, that means a ketogenic diet isn't worth trying because that's absolutely not true. That a ketogenic diet has many more benefits than ketone supplements alone. So if, it, if you've tried it and it hasn't helped you, don't give up. That does not mean that a ketogenic diet couldn't help you. How often do you see it working with patients when they do the ketogenic diet and they do it, quote unquote, the right way, transitioning into it? And then how long does it take? And again, we have to account for that transition phase, but somebody who's feeling like they're going to give this a try and their diet is very classical and standard right now. So two layers to that question. One being how often does it work for people, at least to some extent? Mm -hmm. And then two, how long does it take? So um, let's see. Uh, how often does it work? I've consulted with hundreds of patients over the past 10 years. And, you know, in the early, in the early part, in, in the early part of my practice, I wasn't doing as much work with ketogenic diets as I was, as I gradually, I mean, gradually been using these more and more. And really in the past six, seven years, the ketogenic diet's been the cornerstone of my practice, but I use many different strategies in my practice. So I would say out of all of those people, I can count on less than two hands, <laughs> um, the number of people who have not experienced noticeable, meaningful uh, degree of benefit to their uh, mental health. I can't say that about any medication, not by a long shot. Most medications do not work. They, they can be helpful and they certainly help some people. And for some people, they're really critical part of their, of their uh, treatment plan. Um, but most people do not benefit very much from medication, whereas most people do benefit from changing their diet in the right ways. And it makes sense that that would be true because when you're changing your diet, um, you have access to uh, 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 mechanisms that no medication can, can, can reproduce. You, you can get benefits that, that aren't possible with medication. These are root cause approaches these go directly to the the root cause uh, disturbances that are that we see across the board in neuropsychiatric conditions: the inflammation, the oxidative stress, the insulin resistance, uh, lots of other factors as well that we could talk about. Um, but those are the three, you know, the three of the major ones. And so, um, so most people do benefit. Um, not everybody can come all the way off their medications. Some people can't even uh, reduce the dosages or the number of the medications they're taking, although many people can. Um, there are some people who never need to start medications in the first place because they've used these strategies. Um, so lots of potential benefits. But even if, even if you don't want to stop your medications or because they've been so helpful to you, or, um, or even if you're not able to reduce the dosage or number of medications you're taking using a ketogenic diet, the ketogenic diet is almost always still worth continuing because people feel so much better and they become so much healthier, metabolically healthier on the ketogenic diet, even if they're continuing medications. The ketogenic diet is really the only intervention I'm a, a natural, a non-medication related intervention I'm aware of that can fight the tremendous metabolic uh, disturbances that we see from some of the stronger antipsychotic, uh, the, the uh, stronger psychiatric medications, such as antipsychotics and certain mood stabilizers. So, a combination of one of those medications, which can have metabolic side effects such as weight gain, uh, high blood sugar levels, high insulin levels, high triglycerides, um, uh, and heart disease, type two diabetes. Um, those medications are well known for causing a lot of those issues at, at much higher rates. If you combine those medications with the ketogenic diet, uh, you may not be able to come off of all of your medication in every case, but you will feel a lot better on that medication. Um, and it really will give you uh, a, a lot of benefits metabolically. Um, so, so that's question one is how many people benefit? Most people benefit to some meaningful extent, and some people are able to come completely off medication or eliminate the need for medication. Um, so now the question is, how long does it take? Um, there are some people who respond in three days, some people who respond in two or three weeks, 
and some people who I need to wait uh, more like six months, uh, sorry, um, six weeks to three months. So I usually say three days, three weeks, three months uh, is um, these are the kinds of the most common timeframes that I see. Almost everybody in my experience uh, uh, obtains some noticeable benefit from the diet um, uh, after three weeks. So there's something about that three week mark, which seems to be a turning point metabolically for a lot of people. Um, but in the book, I do recommend that if you haven't seen a lot of improvement by week three, don't, don't give up yet. Keep going because, um, there, there, in, in some cases you may need to, you may need to follow the diet for longer for that shift to take place. Earlier when we talked about, uh, hacking our metabolism and bringing MCT oil or exogenous ketones in, you said that could be helpful for somebody if they fall off the diet. Gets me thinking about how rigid somebody needs to be on this diet as they're transitioning, as they're using it in a therapeutic way. And then long, long term, after they've healed their metabolism, can they get more lax, do you find? With the, you know, because the ketogenic diet is obviously a strict diet and it can be hard, especially in social situations. Can we take our foot off the gas, you know, a couple of years down the line if we've been following this strictly? A couple of things to say about that. So one is uh, it depends on who you are. <laughs> um, there are some people who, who can be a lot more flexible with their diet, even once they've fully fat adapted, even if they've been on the diet for a year or two. Uh, yes, some people can, uh, they notice they've got a little bit more leeway with their diet than they had in the very beginning. Uh, and that suggests that a certain amount of healing has taken place and a certain amount of adaptation has taken place. So there's a little bit more wiggle room there. Um, often there's not a lot, but, but sometimes there is some, uh, there are very few people that I've worked with who have been able to go on a ketogenic diet. Now work with adults only. I'm not a child psychiatrist. There are very few people that I've personally worked with who have uh, gotten benefit from a ketogenic diet, um, stayed on the diet for you know reasonable length of time, say six months, a year, year and a half, two years, and then been able to stop the diet and maintain those th those benefits. Uh, in most of my patients, their symptoms do come back often rather quickly when the diet gets interrupted, and and that's a good th that can be a good reality check for people to say, oh, I guess I really do need to eat this way. Um, so it's good information. Um, uh, useful information, but, uh, but, but we see in children, in children with epilepsy who start a ketogenic diet, um, uh, and there's, you know, decades of, of clinical and research experience in children with epilepsy and ketogenic diets. It's very interesting. Uh, children can, in many cases, um, they can stay on the diet for a year or two for severe epilepsy, multiple seizures per day and come off the diet after a year or two and remain seizure free eating a regular diet. And that is, really strongly indicates that the diet has um, allowed a tremendous amount of healing to take place. Children are much more metabolically flexible. Seizure disorders, epilepsy is a very different kettle of fish than a lot of the mental health disorders we see. Um, so, but I think that in the case of adults who have been, I mean, most of us, you know, feeding our brain improperly our entire lives and with lots of metabolic damage, um, I think many of us are not as metabolically flexible. And so, but I will say that in my patients who have better physical metabolic health, meaning my patients, especially my patients who exercise regularly and have good um, uh, muscle composition in their body, good strength and muscle uh, uh, composition, they tend to do better. They tend to be more metabolically flexible than people who are in, who are only using diet as their pillar of better metabolic health. So um, the people that I have noticed have more leeway in their diet are the ones who are who are uh, also paying attention to their physical fitness. You mentioned the fact that you just work with adults, and then you brought the epilepsy piece into it. Kids using the keto diet to help you know work through that naturally. Any reason you can see from a safety perspective, if a kid is suffering from a mental health challenge, that they couldn't try what we're talking about today? Yeah. So I make it clear in the book, of course, that the book is not for children. The book is not, uh, you know, I, I don't treat children. Um, but, uh, but you know, I work with parents all the time uh, who have children. And of course, they're always asking me, um, you know, what should I feed my child for better mental health? And 
I always recommend uh, sort of the, fir- the, the first, the sort of the gateway dietary strategy in the book that I propose is a, is a paleo diet. Um, it's just much closer to the diet that we, we evolved uh, to eat and therefore makes a lot of biological sense um, and may protect their, their mental and physical health long term, uh, theoretically has that potential to do that. And it's, it's a safe diet, doesn't need any medical monitoring. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what medications you're taking, how old you are. Uh, you can be pregnant, you can be 90 years old, you can be nine years old. Um, a paleo diet is really safe for everybody. Um, so I usually, I really like that as a starting place. Um, but when it comes to ketogenic diets for children, so there are some children who, um, who are going to need, uh, to follow a ketogenic diet for a particular health reason, mental health or other health reason. Um, and, and the ketogenic diet, we know from over a hundred years of experience with ketogenic diets and epilepsy, the ketogenic diets can be safe and can be effective in children. Um, but they have to be constructed properly, meaning you have to take the extra nutrient and protein requirements of children into consideration because they're still growing and their brain is still developing. Um, and so they need, they need more food, more calories, more protein, um, uh, than, uh, than adults do. And one of the mistakes, common mistakes people can make when they're constructing a ketogenic diet is sometimes they go too low on the protein and uh, in order to try to get their ketone levels higher. And you really don't want to skimp uh, on protein. Uh, you can skimp on carbohydrate. There's no diet, there's no biological requirement for carbohydrate. So if your ketones aren't high enough, you really want to lower the carbohydrate before you look at the protein. Um, so, uh, and one of the, one of the problems that the very early ketogenic diets had um, many decades ago is that those ketogenic diets were were designed to mimic fasting to try to get seizures under control. So they they were designed to try to get ketones into the very high the three to five millimole range or even higher in some cases. So they minimized the protein down to say, um, depending on which study you look about, about 6% of calories, not enough protein uh, uh, to sustain long-term uh, uh, growth and reproductive health. And so um, these are some of the cautions about ketogenic diets in children, but again, I should not be making recommendations about ketogenic diets for children because I have no experience in this area. Um, but I just want people to know that that's why ch- there are many reasons. Children are not just short adults. They're, they're very different. Uh, their metabolic needs and their nutritional needs are very different. So at this point, you've given us the template. We've talked about how long it could take for somebody to start feeling the difference making these changes. Can you go over a specific example as a psychiatrist that's worked with a number of different people, lots of people, of a patient you've worked with following this type of quote unquote treatment and the results they had? Yeah. So I give a lot of examples in the book. I give an example of a patient with early Alzheimer's disease, a patient with you know, lifelong depression and anxiety, um, and a patient with, with bipolar disorder, many different uh, examples in the book that I've used uh, so people can, uh, can turn to those. But I'll share an example uh, here that's not in the book. And uh, so this is a, a woman who's very graciously allowed me to share her story, but not her name. So we'll call her Bella. And she is in her 70s. And I've been working with her for a number of years now, at least four years, I believe. And in any case, um, Bella had been uh, hospitalized twice a year, uh, like clockwork, every winter and every summer for usually two to three months at a time for recurrent manic episodes, mania, uh, this part of bipolar disorder. Um, these are exceptionally high energy states, which are disruptive to a person's ability to function. So, um, so uh, uh, unable to sleep, racing thoughts, obsessive worry, um, hyperactivity, things like that. And so uh, her daughter, uh, uh, over the past few years, uh, as she entered her 70s, she also started to develop some some symptoms of psychosis, particularly um, unreasonable fears, what we call paranoia. Um, And about, so for example, if if she'd misplaced a personal item in her apartment and she she lives alone, um, she would automatically assume that somebody from her apartment building had broken into her into her apartment and stolen them. And she was really inconsolable around this. She could not be convinced that this was not the case. 
even when her daughter had uh, closed circuit cameras installed in her apartment to reassure her mother, it still wasn't, she was not reassured. So her daughter consulted with me about uh, whether or not a ketogenic diet might help her. I mean, she's been on just about every kind of psychiatric medication, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, antidepressants over many, many years. Uh, and when she first consulted with me, she was taking a very high dose of uh, uh, an antipsychotic called clozapine and a sort of more moderate dose of another antipsychotic and then a very low dose of a mood stabilizing antidepressant. And she was still not well. She was still being hospitalized twice a year um, even to the point that they had, during her most recent hospitalization, before consulting with me, she'd just received a number of rounds of ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, sometimes called it used to be called electric shock therapy, with very little um, uh, benefit. So she was still doing poorly, um, and so we started a ketogenic diet. And within two weeks, she and her daughter both noticed a really noticeable change. In her, she was in her not only in her fears, but also in her symptoms. Um, she was able to, for example, if she misplaced something in her apartment, you know, she'd call her daughter, and her daughter would say, "Oh, mom, you know, I think you maybe just misplaced it." And she said, "Oh, you're probably right. I'll go take a look." Completely different response. Um, she was waking up three hours earlier every day rather than sleeping half the day away. Um, she was able to read and remember and enjoy uh, stories. Uh, she was able to participate actively in conversations. Her mood was good, uh, 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 and her sleep was excellent. And you know, she um, she's still on this diet to this day. Various versions of the diet. It's an ongoing uh, story, um, but uh, she's doing quite well right now, and uh, has not needed to be in the hospital twice a year anymore. I think she's been hospitalized maybe twice in the past four years. And I I tell this story, and, and she's she's on much less medication. Uh, no clozapine anymore. Um, and uh, she's on two different medications at much lower doses. And I use this example uh, because it's one of those real world examples where you don't see a person able to come off every medication they've taken and never end up back in the hospital. You don't see, um, you know, you don't see a complete resolution of every symptom. What you see is dramatic and sustained improvement and the ability to reduce the number of hospitalizations uh, substantially reduce the dosage and type and 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 uh, the and improve the uh, the types of medications the person is taking as well. Uh, and so, I think that the, the reason I like this example is because this is a woman who had been um, hospitalized and and ill and taking medications for forty plus years, and you might think. And I certainly did quietly to myself think this when they first consulted with me. I'm not sure how much this is going to really help, uh, but um, but we see cases like this, and there are cases like this published in the literature as well, the scientific literature, um, and uh, and and this study that I helped publish uh, about a year and a half ago says the same thing that you can see dramatic improvements, even remission of serious chronic mental illnesses. Um, uh, uh, with ketogenic diets, no matter in how long a person's been ill, no matter what medications they're taking or how many medications or what the dosages are, uh, no matter what the diagnosis is. Um, the study that I helped publish about a year and a half ago, there were people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, severe major depression, on an average of five psychiatric medications, ill for an average of 10 years already. Um, and, and all of them improved on a ketogenic diet if they were able to stay on it for more than two weeks, which most of them were. And 64% of them left the hospital on less psychiatric medication. 44% of them achieved clinical remission from serious mental illness. These dietary interventions are powerful brain medicine. And I think that, that stories like this and studies like this really give tremendous reason for hope almost no matter who you are or where you're at in your mental health journey, I, if you haven't tried these types of interventions, they're really worth exploring and learning more about. I think that whole piece that you mentioned there is just so important. And, and thank you for sharing all that. Coming back to Bella, you mentioned 40 years of suffering before she made this dietary switch. 
Do you find though, if somebody comes to see you after say a year or two versus 40, any differences in how quickly they get better or how long they stay better? We know that there's hope there for the people that have been in this for a long time, but talk about the difference there when you're working with people. Yeah, you know, it's hard. I mean, I've never really tallied it up, but my, but my, my general sense, because I work with people of all ages, I've worked with people in the, people in their eighties. I've worked with people, who, you know, everything from eighteen to 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 eighty eight, right? And, uh, in terms of my nutrition practice, and and I work with all comers. Basically, I'm a general adult psychiatrist. I don't specialize in any particular type of illness. I don't specialize in bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. If you've got PTSD, ADHD, OCD, uh, eating disorders, uh, early dementia bipolar disorder, psychosis, whatever the issue is, depression, anxiety, whatever it is, I will try to help you. And there's the, the, the plus side of that is that I have a lot of experience using these diets in lots of different types of situations with people, lots of different ages. And so what I notice is that it does tend to be the people who are metabolically healthier and the people who are, especially if they're physically fit or younger, they do tend to be more metabolically flexible and they, they often will respond to the diet um, uh, a little bit more readily, but not always. I mean, I definitely have had, I can think, you know, I can think of, you know, a few people who, you know, were in their twenties, early thirties who didn't respond to the diet at all. I mean, the diet does not work for everybody. It certainly doesn't. It, it helps most people, but it does not work for everybody. Um, there are definitely other factors involved, of course. Um, but, uh, I really do believe that the, that, that a food first approach to mental health and in physical health makes sense because once you see what that can do for you first, before you explore other, other options, um, that you can then add on to that treatment, other, maybe more sophisticated options that might be necessary or deeper testing. These are really simple strategies that make a lot of biological sense, Um, And I think it's a great place to start. So, um, and that's where I start. And so that's why I can tell you that most people do benefit. Not everybody gets all the way better, but most people get enough better that they want to continue eating this way long-term. Throughout our discussion, we focused on the ketogenic diet primarily as a whole. There is a spectrum within that, that people could have variants from carnivore, paleo in the middle, all the way to theoretically vegan. I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but I've heard of vegans taking a carnivore, sorry, not a carnivore approach, taking a keto approach. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about that spectrum and what you've seen when people push the boundaries and do either a vegan diet or a carnivore diet. Yeah. So um, I'm nutritionally pro-choice. And so I support people in improving the brain healthiness of their diet, regardless of their dietary preferences. There's actually a lot you can do um, to improve the health of just about any any diet you're eating. Uh, it, it's not all about ketones and it's not even all about plants and animals. Many different changes you can make that, that can benefit you. And so you can start wherever you want to start, right? And so one thing I do in the book is I don't just have these three different types of plans you can explore, but but also a list of single changes you can make. If you if you're a dip your toe in the water kind of person or a one at a time kind of person, and you just want to make one change at a time, please do. Um, if you don't want to completely overhaul your diet all at once, any change you make is going to be a step in the right direction if you know which changes are the right ones to try. So, um, you can, uh, and, and the other thing to mention about, uh, you know, vegan diets, uh, uh, carnivore diets, ketosis is that carnivore diets are almost always naturally ketogenic. Not always. There are ways to eat a carnivore diet where you will not be in ketosis. If you overeat protein, you will not be in ketosis, for example. Um, but, uh, but there are, but, but you can also, um, and a vegan diet is usually not ketogenic but can be. So if you know how to construct the diet to get the insulin levels down, you need to basically reduce your carbohydrate intake on a vegan diet down to the, you know, the level that you're going to start burning fat. It's harder to do with a vegan diet because the protein sources on vegan diets tend to be very starchy, Uh, but it can be done. Uh, Especially if you, uh, you can use tofu, for example, as an excellent example of a low keto friendly vegan source of protein. 
And it also happens to be a complete protein. So you're in luck there. So there, you can do it. It can be done. And you will need, you will need careful supplementation, uh, of course. Um, but you can get the benefits of a ketogenic diet no matter what uh, your dietary preferences are. Because ketosis is not a food list. It's a metabolic state. Uh, of low insulin levels. And as long as you're eating in a way that your insul insulin levels are not about plants and animals, insulin levels are about your macronutrient ratios, carbohydrate, fat, and protein. If they're in the right range, it doesn't matter what foods you're eating, um, you can get there. So I want everybody to know that they can take advantage of that metabolic state. Um, and, the, and there are people who have done it um, and have written books about it. And there are cookbooks, there are vegan cookbooks available. Please don't let um, that stand in your way of exploring this very important and very powerful metabolic strategy. Okay. But when we look at the vegan diet from a metabolic perspective, we can see how we could make that work for ketosis. Mm -hmm. But we did talk about ALA before and DHA and EPA. There are There is a list of different nutrients. And you did touch on the fact they would need to supplement but I don't want to give people false hope in that diet that if they go ketogenic, that that's going to be enough. And I know you haven't, but I want to further expand on that because there are certain nutrients that somebody isn't going to be getting if they're limiting themselves in that way. That's true. I mean, of course the diet, and so the diet needs to do three, a brain healthy diet needs to do three things. So one of the, one of, one of my goals in the book was to define for the first time, I, I think really what a brain healthy diet needs to needs to be. So my definition of a brain healthy diet is it has to nourish the brain, protect the brain, energize the brain, right? It has to nourish the brain by providing all essential nutrients. Now that is a no brainer, so to speak. Of course, the brain needs all essential nutrients. So uh, a vegan diet, if it's constructed only of whole foods and does not contain supplements or fortified processed foods, is a, a nutritionally inadequate diet for a human being. And that's very well known. And the problem goes beyond B12 to other nutrients as well will be in short supply. So it's very, very important, no matter what dietary pattern you're eating, to make sure you're getting all your nutrients. And vegans will uh, have the most difficulty meeting their nutrient needs. But, um, but um, most people <laughs> are not meeting all their nutrient needs, even when they're eating a mixed diet, because partly because we've been encouraged to eat uh, less, and, uh, less and less animal food, uh, which is where most of the nutrients are, and also because we've been uh, advised to uh, get most of our nutrients from, uh, from to base our diets on uh, starchy staples, uh, namely grains and legumes. So grains like, like corn, rice, wheat, oats, and legumes like bees, peas, and lentils, right? And, and then uh, versions, you know, various processed versions of those things like breads and pastas and so forth, right? That's the foundation of the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is 45 to 65% carbohydrate. That's also what the standard merit that the, the USDA recommends, 45 to 65% of calories should come from carbohydrates. So, um, so if you're eating that way, it's not just that you might not be getting enough nutrients from animal foods. It's that the foundation of your diet is, is nutritionally very poor. The, these starchy staples are really nutrient poor, very few nutrients in them, but they're also high in anti-nutrients. So they are actively interfering with your ability to access a certain number of essential nutrients, particularly like one great example is minerals, calcium, magnesium, uh, and uh, iron and zinc these foods actively work against your ability to absorb those nutrients. So many people who eat an omnivorous diet are iron deficient. Many people who eat an omnivorous diet don't have, their zinc levels are inadequate. Um, they may need to supplement magnesium to feel well. Um, there are lots of, lots of nutrient deficiencies that you can see even in the standard uh, sort of mixed diet. So um, the reason why I took so much time in the book to explain not just ketogenic diets and insulin resistance and metabolic psychiatry. I took a lot of time in the book to explain nutrition <laughs> because ketones, as you just said so wisely, ketones aren't enough. The brain needs more than just ketones. The brain can't function on ketones alone. The brain needs building blocks. The brain needs all of those 
uh, vitamins and minerals uh, and, 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 and the right kind of fuel in order to energize itself, maintain itself, and operate at its best. Um, so, and where do all of those molecules come from? They come from your food. So uh, ketones alone, brain can't live on ketones alone. It needs nutrients as well. And you need to know which foods contain those nutrients, which foods allow you to access those nutrients, and which foods uh, you can absorb those nutrients from and utilize properly. And I think that's a big uh, part of the book is, is re kind of relearning what a healthy diet uh, actually looks like. All right. So we're going to leave the vegan piece now and go to the other end of the spectrum, carnivore diet. And I know you personally experimented with this diet for eight and a half months, felt better than you've ever felt. So have you take me back to when that was and talk about what you experienced. I think it was 2019. I can't remember. It was, it was before the pandemic, I think a year or two before the pandemic, um, uh, eight and a half months. And, oh, actually it was 2018 to 2019. Cause I just left Smith college. Yes. I remember. So, um, uh, eight and a half months, this was meat, seafood, poultry, water, seltzer, salt, um, no, uh, caffeine, no alcohol, no spices. Uh, and, uh, uh, it really was a very, very strict carnivore diet. And as you said, I, I really never felt better in my life. Um, there were some challenges, social challenges, particularly when traveling, uh, especially when you consider the fact that uh, many carnivores uh, are able to eat beef and pork and eggs and dairy products. And I was not because of my many food sensitivities able to, to enjoy any of those foods. So I had a very limited carnivore diet that made it really challenging when I was traveling to get the right kinds of food and enough food. Um, so, but despite that, I did, I did continue it for that long a period of time because it was, it was such a, a positive experience. Um, and, uh, it really is, I think, um, one of another, one of those dietary experiments that if you haven't tried it before, um, especially if you haven't gotten benefit from other dietary strategies, it's worth considering at least as a short-term experiment to see if that might be the issue. Could it be that you are, that you have lost your ability or a decent amount of your ability to tolerate uh, and manage uh, the naturally occurring, many, many, many naturally occurring uh, toxins that exist in plant foods that plant foods use to defend themselves? We evolved alongside these, these uh, plant foods, many of them we've been eating for, you know, since time immemorial. But unfortunately, so we, we've evolved some coping strategies to deal with their defensive toxins. It's kind of like a forever war where they're always trying to get us and we're always trying to outsmart them, right? So this is, na this is nature. Um, so we've evolved some strategies. We don't absorb a lot of these toxins uh, or we rapidly eliminate the ones that we do absorb. We have an intestinal lining. We have a microbiome. We have lots of different, we have enzymes. We have lots of different uh, strategies to help us deal with the toxins that are in plant foods. But many of us have lost, uh, uh, we've, we've, we've got some damage to our gut lining or we've got some damage uh, to our immune system uh, and we no longer are able to safely defend ourselves against these defensive toxins as well as we maybe once were. And so for a lot of us, uh, maybe we've been exposed to pesticides or or plastics or antibiotics or other types of medications or environmental toxins over the years that have broken down some of our defenses. Uh, uh, or processed foods can do the same thing. Linoleic acid, there was a recent study that showed that this can disrupt the gut lining. So uh, we, are, we may be damaged in certain ways and we may benefit from limiting or eliminating at least temporarily to allow maybe some healing to take place eliminating most or all plant foods from the diet to give the system some time to heal and try to recover. And um, so the, the book is designed to help you explore that strategy as well. If that's something that you're interested in, it explains, you know, what some of the risks and benefits are um, and uh, how to think about it and how to approach it safely. So um, I think that uh, uh, it's one of those strategies that in my practice has been a really important uh, troubleshooting tool um, for people who don't benefit enough from other dietary interventions. 
you talked about the fact that during this experiment, you cut out caffeine. Do you feel like that's a worthwhile adjunct to what we've talked about today for somebody that's going to go on a mental health journey and, and change their diet? Yeah. So, um, I never lead with caffeine. <laughs> so if someone's coming to see me for the first time, uh, the last thing I want to do is scare them away uh, by suggesting that you know they may they may uh, uh, want to consider uh, doing a caffeine free experiment. So we choose our battles. We start we start simple and we start big. You know, let's look at the fundamental structure of the diet first, right? And then I use caffeine and alcohol sweeteners. Um, and other types of controversial uh, 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 additives to the diet, I use these as troubleshooting strategies. So if you make these fundamental changes to your diet and you don't see enough benefit, then we go to, into troubleshooting mode, right? So let's say you've been in ketosis for, for three months. Um, your ketone levels have been in a, a theoretically therapeutic range just about all the time, just about every day for you know uh, three months and you're not feeling that much better, it's time to troubleshoot. And so clearly ketones are not the issue. There must be something else going on. Maybe you're, maybe there's a food sensitivity at play. Maybe the caffeine is, is uh, destabilizing your metabolism, your stress hormone levels, your sleep, your appetite. Um, uh, maybe, maybe the whatever amount of alcohol is in your diet, um, if, if you haven't looked at that before, could be disrupting your sleep, your mood, uh, your metabolism. There, there are there's good reason that we know that the science is very clear that both of those drugs, alcohol and caffeine, both of those drugs do disrupt your metabolism and your sleep and, 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 and your brain function. Um, but, but not everybody, you know, needs to remove them to feel well. So everybody's a little different in terms of, you know, how important those particular aspects of their diet will be to their recovery. And that's why so much about, of, of the book, uh, allows for, you know, really personalizing these to your situation. Um, and uh, I, I really, I, I have quite a few patients who do very well keeping the caffeine in their diet and they, they're, they're thriving. And I have others who have needed to take it. And this is a minority. So take heart. It's a minority, a minority of patients who have needed to remove the caffeine to get full, full benefit and really feel their best. Earlier, we talked about fish oil. I want to put that aside for now, but talk about supplements. Otherwise, for somebody that, again, is beginning on this journey, is there any supplements that if they run into specific challenges that might be useful and in a general sense? Yes. So, um, you know, most people, the, the way they approach supplements is, oh, the more the merrier, it's like an insurance policy. Why not take them? How can they, you know, what, what could go wrong? Right. So most people in this country take a multivitamin supplement, for example. Um, and, uh, I, I do not, uh, um, uh, I do not follow that philosophy in my work. I believe in supplementation when necessary, but I don't believe in blind sort of shotgun supplementation. And a lot of reasons for that. One is, uh, it might not be necessary. Uh, another is it costs money. And the third is they can have side effects and can throw nutrient systems out of balance. We are not designed to take in concentrated, uh, sources of vitamins, uh, you know, extracts and, uh, sources of vitamins and minerals. We are designed to extract vitamin minerals from whole foods. Uh, we regulate our uh, the um, the amount we absorb and how it's processed much better if if we take them in from whole foods. So you can see imbalances uh, as a result of supplementation. You can see toxicities uh, from people taking uh, supplements and uh, that are very very difficult. It's very very difficult to experience a nutrient toxicity when you're eating whole foods. So, um, so, so there are the risks, um, that being said, I do, uh, recommend for all of my patients that they get some basic nutrient testing before we start dietary changes to see where things are at. Um, the, the ones that are, you know, most often problematic are ferritin, which is a measure of iron storage can often be too low. Um, B12 sometimes can be too low. Um, and, uh, so, uh, and vitamin D3, very, very common, uh, nutrient deficiency and sometimes B2 and B6 as well. So there are certain nutrient deficiencies that are fairly common in the general population. So we want to watch for those. And so then we make our dietary changes. We see how the person's doing. And then if they're still not doing well after a certain period of time, that's when you might want to explore, 
uh, more broad, broader nutrient testing. Um, but if you see a nutrient deficiency um, that has not that you can't correct with the diet, um, then that needs to be supplemented. So, for example, uh, B12. Um, even if you're eating a diet that includes uh, an adequate amount of animal foods, which are you know, the only place where you can get B12 from, from whole foods, is animal foods, you might not be able to absorb it properly. There are many common conditions that interfere with our ability to absorb and process B12. So you may need a supplement even uh, on the healthiest uh, of diets. So nutrient testing uh, is used to guide supplementation and supplementation is used when diet alone is not enough. That's at least how I look at it. Before we part ways, I want to talk about the gut brain connection and even beyond the realm of mental health in the health space these days, there's a lot of talk about the microbiome and gut health and, and the connection to the brain. So how do you think about all that? Yeah. So the microbiome is fascinating and really important. And the science in this area is just, uh, exploding. Uh, and so, uh, and, and it's, and it, you know, the microbiome, so the trillions of bacteria in your gut, these do communicate with the brain. Uh, they communicate during, uh, in, in, in both directions through multiple pathways, um, directly through, uh, cellular pathways and indirectly through, uh, hormonal pathways and neurotransmitter pathways, uh, so, uh, and immune pathways. And so, um, they're intimately connected. Um, the brain knows what the gut is up to and vice versa. Um, so this is a really important system. Um, what we don't know yet, um, is how to eat to optimize our microbiome. We don't even really know yet what an optimal microbiome is supposed to look like, or if there even is one definition of an optimal microbiome. Microbiome. So right now, what we have is a lot of guesswork uh, based on um, uh, based on uh, food questionnaires and associations, weak associations between how different people report eating and what their microbiome looks like and their gut health and so forth. We do not. We're not yet at the level of clinical experimentation, human experiments, where we change the diet in particular ways and improve. Uh, the health of the gut and the the health of the microbiome. We don't have that level of information yet. So, um, uh, but that's not to say the microbiome isn't important. It is, but we don't yet have reliable uh, uh, clinical trial evidence helping us understand what the microbiome wants to eat. We do know what the microbiome does not want to eat, and that's ultra processed foods. I mean, that's very very uh, that's very well established. But beyond that. It's very difficult to make any claims about uh, what the microbiome wants for dinner. You quickly mentioned neurotransmitters there. And throughout our conversation, I don't think they came up another time, which is interesting <laughs> because you're a classically trained psychiatrist. And when we talk about psychiatry medications right away, I think about neurotransmitters using drugs to manipulate those. Do you feel like in the world of psychiatry, that emphasis has been overblown? Yes and no. Um, it's been overblown in that uh, the medications that we've been use, using to target these uh, neurotransmitter systems don't work for most people, um, but they do help some people. And because they help some people, there is, uh, uh, by extension, some truth to the neurotransmitter theory of certain mental illnesses, particularly when it comes to um, psychotic disorders and, um, and bipolar disorder much weaker, uh, almost non-existent evidence for uh, neurotransmitter imbalances in depression, particularly serotonin, uh, the serotonin deficit theory, uh, which uh, you know, we, we prescribe these medicines called SSRIs or SRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, to help the serotonin in the brain work better because the theory is that um, if you have depression, maybe your serotonin levels are running low, um, so they need some help. Um, but there's very little scientific support for that theory. Uh, and these medications don't help most people with depression. Uh, but the neurotransmitters are not, it's not that mental health issues don't have to do with neurotransmitters. They do. Neurotransmitters are very important in the brain for cell to cell communication, for regulating mood, appetite, sleep, uh, energy, all kinds of different things, metabolism. Uh, the, these neurotransmitters are of course very important and they can become dysregulated uh, in mental health conditions, um, 
Uh, but, uh, but, it, but, but rather than trying to figure out which medication you might use to try to rebalance one or two of these, why don't we ask what's causing these, this dysregulation in the first place? And there's very clear science on this. And I've put this in the book as well. I explain how it is that, uh, Refined carbohydrates and refined vegetable oils by creating inflammation and oxidative stress can throw multiple neurotransmitters out of balance, not just serotonin, but also dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, melatonin, glutamate, GABA, many different neurotransmitters. So um, again, first do no harm. Uh, see if your brain can regulate its own neurotransmitters properly if you stop uh, uh, trying to throw it out of balance with the wrong foods. So I think that there's a lot of hope there. Um, and, uh, and, and that, uh, if, for people who are really, really believe in, uh, the, the neurotransmitter imbalance theory of mental illness, what I'll explain to you in the book, how it is that food has a direct and very, uh, substantial role in, uh, th those, those chemical imbalances that, that may be driving certain mental health conditions. All right, Dr. Reed, I think that's a good place to end. Really enjoyed this conversation, far reaching. We got into a lot of detail. We're going to link everything up in the show notes, your new book, which I absolutely loved, your social media, your website. And I just want to thank you for everything that you do and for coming on the show. I really want to thank you uh, for, for taking the time to read the book, for your interest in, the, in this really important topic, for, for letting me speak to your listeners, and, and for a really wonderful, as you said, far-reaching conversation that went deeper than many do. And so I, I, I really appreciate it and hope people find it helpful. I'm sure they will. Thank you again. Thank you. Now that you're done, you're going to want to head over here and catch my chat with Dr. Chris Palmer. He'll teach even more about using your diet to optimize your mental health. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. This is the missing link that we have been searching for when trying to understand mental disorders. It is so obvious.